leave to ask the question standing in my name. <coughs> my Lords, the EU settlement scheme opened on a trial basis at the end of August and a second pilot phase ended on the 21st of December. In the light of positive progress, we commenced the wider public testing of the scheme on the 21st of January. The EU settlement scheme will be fully open by the 30th of March. My Lords, we recently had a letter dated 11th of this month from Caroline Noakes, the Minister for Immigration, telling us everything was wonderful and it's all going OK. This is just not true. The Home Office seems to be living in a bubble of their own making. When will they start listening to the people, uh, many of the 3.6 million EU citizens in this country, struggling to make sense of a technical and bureaucratic shambles which is not fit for purpose. The internet is awash with frustration, anger, fear and distress in relation to the obstacles in accessing the system, ridiculous demands for evidence, obviously wrong decisions, decisions made by machines and no proper means of appeal. Is it not time to scrap the scheme, start afresh with a simple system based on a simple acceptance of the rights of the people already living here. Yeah. Well, my Lords, the whole construction of the scheme was designed to be simple and as, as, as unbureaucratic uh, as possible. And to date, we've had 100,000 applications in total. In terms of the plethora of evidence that people need to supply, in fact, people only need to supply three pieces of evidence, the first being their identity, uh, the second being their residency, and the third being um, absence of criminal convictions. My lords, my lords, um, the uh, scrapping of the fee, of course, was very welcome news uh, when that was announced by the Prime Minister. Now, obviously, of that 100,000 people that so far applied, a number of those would have paid a fee. Can the noble lady tell the House how many have so far been reimbursed that fee, as the Prime Minister promised? Well, the noble lord is absolutely right to point out that, that point that, in fact, nobody uh, any longer has to pay for the fee. But while, while the, um, the system for, uh, for actually returning the fee is, is in train, people are continuing to pay the fee and will have it uh, reimbursed, although that doesn't, that, that doesn't seem to have deterred people from applying for the settlement scheme. Uh, my lords, does my noble friend not remember that as early as July 2016, your Lordship's House advised that it would be a good idea to take the moral high ground and to give the guarantee to that three million plus EU citizens living in this country. Even arch Brexiteers like my noble friend, uh, um, Lord Forsyth, Lord Forsyth, <laughs> spoke up in favour of that approach. Does she not regret the fact that the government neglected to take your Lordship's advice? Yeah. Well, my, Lord, I th my Lords, I think um, in answer to my noble friend's question, the, the Prime Minister has always been clear that EU citizens, um, the 3.6 the 3 million of them, will be welcome here. And in fact, whether it's a deal situation or a no deal situation, through the EU settlement scheme, they can establish their status here. My Lord, how valid was the uh, pilot scheme launched by the government, given that they chose a very easy sample? Well, I don't know if the sample was easy. Um, the sample uh, was certainly in the northwest of England, which I was uh, very pleased about, um, and it involved staff and students at 15 institutions in the northwest. Um, and, uh, 65% of those who uh, applied received settled status and 35% pre-settled status. Uh, in, uh, the, in the pilot scheme, 30% uh, were only granted pre-settled status, which only lasts for five years. And one, uh, one, one problem seems to be that the automatic checks of HMRC and DWP are not uh, validating uh, a lot of people, particularly the self-employed, uh, who have been here for longer than five years. And the danger is that people will find giving supplementary evidence su such a hassle 
uh, that they'll just kind of settle for pre-settled. But that is very dangerous. Can the Minister look into whether the Home Office could send them reminders, like the HMRC does for sending your tax return, to remind them that they have got to convert that into the full settled status? Well, I thank the noble lady for that question, and she's right that someone who might have pre-settled status might then forget to actually um, uh, apply for the, the full settled status. Um, of course, they have five years to do that, but I will certainly uh, take the noble lady's constructive point uh, back and, um, and respond to her in, in, in due course. How is the government getting on in safeguarding the position of our fellow countrymen and women living in other European Union countries? Well, of course, my noble friend is, is right to point out uh, that fact because, of course, we have, as the UK, given that, um, that uh, comfort to any EU citizens. And um, I hope that in, in, through the no negotiations that our citizens living in the EU will have similar comfort. The noble Lord, the min uh, lady, the minister, has been very supportive of this approach, and I applaud her for that. But isn't the government a tad complacent in going on about 100,000 people have already applied? That is less, it's about 2% of those eligible to stay. And bearing in mind the government keeps saying D-Day is the 30th of March, isn't there a long way to go yet and shouldn't this step up the campaigns? Well, the noble lord hits on a point, actually, which I have myself raised, which is that we need to um, we need to step up some of the pu public uh, information systems that will allow those EU citizens who will want to uh, apply for that settled status to have the knowledge of how they can apply and where they can apply. Um, and, and so he's correct on that point. But in terms of are we being complacent, no. Those beta testing phases have actually worked very, very well. And I fully expect that when the system is up and running um, in, in, properly in, on, on March the uh, 30th, uh, that the, the, the system will continue to run well. My laws. say a little more about the rights of British citizens who find themselves settled in the EU on March the 30th. Will they enjoy onward movement, which will allow them to continue to earn a living if that is indeed the way in which they earn their living? Yeah. Well, I certainly hope that that will be the case, and that will be certainly at the forefront of the Prime Minister's mind when she is uh, negotiating with our colleagues in the EU. Lord Story. I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. <coughs> my Lords, multi-academy trusts achieving value for money is at the forefront of my priorities. It is essential that we challenge trusts paying high individual salaries or with high le leadership team costs. We've been doing this for more than a year. We have recently re-emphasised re it earlier this month and we will continue to do so throughout 2019. High salaries and leadership costs need to be justified with evidence of robust processes for setting salaries and reductions where appropriate. Yes, I'm grateful for the Minister's reply and I know he is concerned about this matter. I, I was interested to read an advert for the Floriat Free School where they're advertising for a PA to the Chief Executive and for finance officers. These posts were all to be volunteers. So they've obviously not got the money in their budgets to pay for these important po uh, posts. At the same time, the chief executive of one of our multi-academy trusts is on a salary of £440,000, nearly three times the uh, salary of our Prime Minister. At a time, does the Minister not think at a time where schools are having to make cuts, struggling with their budgets, that this issue needs to be properly addressed? Yeah. Yeah. My Lords, to deal with the second part of the Noble Lord's question first, the, the trust to which he refers to is the Harris Trust, and frankly they are delivering the most extraordinary outcomes for children. If you take the cost of the Chief Executive's salary and divide it by the number of pupils, it is some of the best value for money government could ever achieve. If you wouldn't be saying that, my Noble Lords, if you had a child that just had an Oxbridge offer and had been there on free school meals. 
Coming to the broader question of funding in the system, we, have, we announced last year a 1.3 billion additional funding. We've announced the plans to reform the national funding formula so that the disparities that exist across the system are gradually ironed out. And there is a great deal that we're doing to support schools in becoming more efficient, which I can perhaps deal with in later questions. My Lords, uh, given the uh, concern on the Liberal benches about salary levels and value for money, and given the fantastic, having visited four of the schools, the fantastic success of the Harris Academies, might my noble friend not consider uh, commissioning an inquiry which will demonstrate that value for money, and perhaps he might ask Mr Nick Clegg to lead that inquiry? <laughs> I think the question answers itself, my Lord. <laughs> I wouldn't want Nick Clegg anywhere near government or... Uh, now he's helping himself... Now he's, now he's helping himself to a salary of some $7 million a year to promote an extraordinary organisation that is generating mental health issues throughout our young people, and I'll deal with that in the next question. Yes. Now that the advertising uh, is over... Um, can I make the point that uh, in, uh, in academies primary as well as uh, secondary, head teachers uh, earn on average more than their counterparts in the maintained sector, while paying their sta the teaching staff uh, less than their counterparts uh, in the maintained sector. That's a sort of avarice that results when uh, schools are allowed to abandon national pay scales. Now, the, the noble Lord the Minister talked about writing to academy trusts, uh, which indeed he did to those with senior staff earning more than the Prime Minister. Uh, but they can ignore him because he has absolutely no powers to compel them to moderate senior pay. My Lord, it's not just salaries in academies that are out of control. Academy trusts themselves are out of the control of government ministers, and that should not be the case. So can the noble Lord the Minister say if the government will introduce measures to ensure that academy trusts are f held fully accountable for the public resources that they spend? Because the next Labour government certainly will. Yeah. My Lord, I don't think the Noble Lord understands the degree of scrutiny that Academy Trust is subjected to. It's a far higher level of scrutiny than local authority schools. They have to submit audited accounts every year. A comparative school in the local authority sector is only audited on average every three or four years, and that information is not published or easily available. So I disagree fundamentally with the Noble Lord's point. In terms of comparable salaries between the two sectors, a, a head teacher of, a, of an academy is on about an average of about 92,000 a year compared to 88,000 a year for a maintained secondary head. But, um, but there are more responsibilities for, uh, for the heads in the academy schools. We've also seen through a recent survey, the Creston report, since we bag began our campaign, and the Noble Lord says that we don't have any leverage, in the last year, according to this report, in the highest band, they have six bands, of so pupils five to 10,000. The salaries have fallen from 140,000 to 114. My lords, my lords, my lords, my lords, my lords. My lords. Just had your benches. Uh, my lords. Uh, my lords, uh, my noble friend has just referred to the £440,000 salary, which the noble lord the minister described as reasonable. Now, in the world of finance that he comes from, that might be a reasonable salary. In the world of education I come from, that salary is nothing short of obscene. And at a time when teachers are having real pay cuts and they're often having to subsidise teaching materials because there's nothing in the school budget to pay for them, how on earth can the government justify this unacceptable face of education? Yeah. My Lords, the justification is very simple. You take the number of pupils in that trust, you divide the, the senior management team cost by pupil, and you look at the extraordinary results being achieved. These were schools that were failing. They'd been abandoned by local authorities for decades, and these children are now getting extraordinary life chances. My Lords, can I first declare that I have no connection with the Harris Academy uh, <laughs> Trust? Um, but could I ask the Noble Lord, the Minister, what assessment the Government has made of the correlation between uh, the Academy Trusts and their senior management and the number of instances of fraud or serious misconduct in terms of presentation of statistics? 
My Lords, as I was answering to the, the noble Lord opposite me earlier, the, sub, the Academy Trusts are subject to a great deal of scrutiny and we continue to review it. For example, from April of this year, any Academy Trust requiring a related party transaction in excess of £20,000 needs prior approval from the ESFA, that's the agency that manages them, and all have to be disclosed. Those are not requirements under the local authority schools between local authorities and academies, which is of crucial importance, I'd have thought, to anyone that believes in democracy, is that ultimately local authority schools, if parents or residents in the area do not like the performance of the schools and the local authority, they have the capacity to remove them in an election. Uh, and that's the best form of accountability, is the accountability via a, general, uh, via a local election. And isn't that the fundamental difference between them and academies, where once they're set up, there's very little anyone can do about removing yeah. them? Yeah. My Lords, if that system worked, we wouldn't have had hundreds, if not thousands, of failing local authority schools that perpetuated themselves for decades. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Lords, I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name in the order paper and draw the House's attention to my declared interests on the register. My Lords, costs for parents and local authorities will vary depending on the circumstances of individual cases. Local authorities and families can access free advice and information about SEN tribunal hearings. The vast majority of cases for education, health and care needs assessments are concluded without the need to resort to tribunal hearings. I thank the Minister for that reply. The uh, figures I have been provided by the British Spectre Association are that local authorities are having to fork out nearly £10,000 for each of these appeals, that, t that the parents are having to fork out over £6,000 for each of these appeals. The Tiger parents are winning nine out of ten of these appeals. Would the Minister care to speculate on the situation of somebody who is on the minimum wage and can't afford £6,000, or knows how to deal with local bureaucracy through, for instance, having the same educational problems as their child. How well are they going to cope with this system? Yeah. Yeah. My Lords, the tribunal process is designed to be as accessible as possible. Parents should be able to appeal and present their case without the need for expensive legal representation. And local authorities should also not need to engage lawyers. Free advice and support about appealing, appealing is available from the Tribunal, and locals send information, advice and support services which exist in, in every local area. And just to put some perspective around this, only 1.5% of cases are appealed to, to Tribunals, so it is not as, as serious in terms of the percentage that it should that it's often said, but we accept that it is an issue and we are looking at how we can improve it. My Lords, um there is a danger of us asking similar questions on this issue and goading the Minister into getting his fists up. So let me try and propose to him, to the noble Lord the Minister, that he might talk to his Secretary of State about what is clearly a growing problem mm -hmm. and whilst resource is fundamental to it, so is the process adopted by some local authorities. Would he not suggest to his Secretary of State that a meeting of all English upper tier local authorities might be drawn together so that they can examine best practice but also ensure that in the end the money goes to the pupils and not to the lawyers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. To reassure the noble lord, I would never take my fists to him under any circumstances, but you raise a very important point because there are a number of local authorities that have literally zero appeals and others that have a, a much higher proportion, and it is important that we get them to talk to each other. I think there are a couple of other points to make. Firstly, under the old regime that ended in 2014, the numbers of appeals were rising every year, so this is not a new trend. And the other thing is, under the new scheme, we have two extra areas of potential appeal because we have a much long, uh, longer age group. We now take them instead of just to 16 to 25 and we are also piloting in some areas the ability to appeal on the health and social care element. But the main point that the Noble Lord makes about better collaboration between all local authorities is well taken. My Lords, if appeals are successful, could my noble friend advise the House whether the costs are always reimbursed? My Lords, I don't have that information to hand, but I will write to the Noble Lord to deal with it specifically. My Lords, uh, autism is the special 
educational need, which most often features at SEND appeals. Um, and many of the cases which uh, result are from local authorities having refused uh, an education, health and care plan needs assessment. Uh, yet the majority of such appeals are won by parents. I very much take on board the point made by my noble friend uh, uh, Lord Blunkett about bringing local authorities together, but would the noble Lord the Minister accept that where uh, a child has an autism diagnosis that fits in with the SEND code of practice, that it should not be permissible for a local authority to deny that child's family a needs assessment? The noble Lord is right that auti autism is the highest proportion of all claimants, around 40 uh, appeals, about 43%. And we are very much focusing on this as an area of concern. In December of last year, we announced a number of, of, of items to help to deal with this, including joining up the health care and education services to address autistic children's needs holistically, developing diagnostic services to diagnose autism earlier, improving the transition between children and adult services so that no young people miss out, and also improving the understanding of autism and all its profiles, including recently identified forms such as pathological <laughs> demand avoidance. My Lord, may I declare that um, my personal interest is because I have a grandson on the spectrum, and also we're getting a very large number of those with mental disabilities now joining through PIP onto the Motability Scheme. I completely support what Lord Addington has been referring to, and it is, it's 89% is the, is the number, and it cost £34 million last year. These are figures, by the way, for the Ministry of Justice. We're fortunate to have a minister who is hugely interested in trying to enhance the position for them, but the real question I wanted to pose, if I might, is it goes beyond money, the anguish of the parents and the upset and that is the key factor when you think it goes beyond money. And it, I'd like to ask the Minister for his ways of being able to expedite all the things we would like to see happen. I absolutely share the Noble Lord's point that if any of you, for any of you who are parents, we all know that one, a parent can never be happier than their least happy child. And so that there is the huge emotional issues that are, that are around this and this is why we're continually reviewing the policies. I mentioned in my reply to, the, to my Noble Lord opposite, even in December of this year, we're also increasing the capital funding available to special schools where, where they have severe difficulties in, in autism. It's, it's very easy to forget in the talking of, of tribunals and costs to local authorities to government that we're actually talking about children and young people who have special needs. In many cases, these are severe special needs. I think the Minister will remember that when we had, during the Children and Families a Bill, the establishment of education health care plans, everybody celebrated. But now that celebration has turned into a nightmare, as parent after parent after parent does not get the package that they need. And the fact that we've now got parents actually going to the High Court demanding a judicial review is surely an indictment of where we're at. Yeah. My Lord, as I mentioned to, in an earlier question, the percentage of appeals is, is one and a half percent. I think, and, and that is not broadly much higher than under the old regime that changed in 2014. This is a new way of dealing with children with needs, and I think we need to remember that, and we are still on a learning curve. We have made a significant investment in this area since it was rolled out, 391 million in total, dealing with a whole range of things, including, for example, the Parent Care Forums, where one of the key parts of these reforms was to put parents at the centre of the process. But I do accept that any level of appeal is causing distress, and we are working to reduce it. Baroness Blackstone. My Lords, I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. Uh, my Lords, CPS policy on assisted suicide provides guidance to prosecutors on assessing the evidential and public interest stages in reaching decisions in cases of encouraging or assisting suicide. The policy sets out the public interest factors that must be applied in reaching decisions in these cases and balances the various important factors that need to be considered. There are no plans to reassess the CPS policy in relation to such cases. I, I thank the Minister for his reply, uh, but does he really think it's a good use of police time to interview under caution 
the wife of a dying man who wishes to choose how he dies, and in the light of the Whaley story uh, and the treatment of loving families like criminals, does the minister think that law on assisted dying is working well? Uh, my lords, uh, it is for the CPS to apply the law, not to make the law. Uh, every case uh, has to turn on its own facts and circumstances. Where matters are drawn to the attention of the police uh, relating to uh, an assisted suicide or potential assisted suicide, uh, they will uh, investigate. Uh, they are uh, bound to investigate what is potentially criminal conduct uh, in terms of Section 2 of the Suicide Act 19. Uh, 61. Uh, and therefore, uh, I see no reason why uh, they should pause uh, those investigations given the current state of the law. Does the Minister recall that the CPS policy was adopted after the decision of the Appellate Committee of this House in 2009 in the Debbie Purdy case? I declare an interest uh, as her counsel. And the Appellate Committee required a policy because of the uncertainty of the law. Would the Minister accept that there continues to be very considerable uncertainty in this area, uh, as indicated by Baroness Blackstone's question, which is causing enormous distress uh, to those at the end of their lives and their families? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the noble Lord is quite right that uh, a consultation was prompted by a decision uh, of the court in England and Wales. Uh, that uh, led to uh, a consultation exercise that commenced in September 2009, to which there were more than 5,000 responses, and resulted in the publication of the CPS policy document in 2010. It, I consider that that policy is working well at the present time. Does my, does my noble friend understand, as I'm sure he does, that for people with a terminal illness, with no hope of recovery, who are suffering great distress, that for these people, the current law, which prevents them from being able to end their own lives in dignity, is condemning them to great and unnecessary suffering. Of course, we're conscious of the difficulties and the challenges facing people in the situation that the noble lord has outlined. But again, I emphasise uh, it is for the CPS to apply the law, not to make the law. And in doing so, they follow a policy that not only addresses an evidential test, but also a public interest test with regard to such cases. And the consequence is that of 140 odd cases referred in the last nine years to the CPS, uh, there were prosecutions in respect of Section 2 of the Suicide Act 1961 in only four of those cases, resulting in one acquittal and three uh, uh, convictions. My Lords, um, I think we can. Forgive me. Uh, the police are only enforcing the law, so it's really the law that's the problem rather than the police. So when will the government bring in a new law to free the police from having to treat loving families like criminals? Yeah. Well, Lord, it's not a case of having to treat loving families like criminals. It is a matter of having to look at the facts and circumstances of every case in situations in which the victim may be extremely vulnerable. And therefore, as the government has said before, that is a matter for Parliament because it is a matter of conscience and it is not a matter for government uh, to bring forward such legislation. And indeed, the noble Lord will be aware uh, that such legislation was proposed in 2015 and did not uh, succeed. Lords, given the numbers, the statistics which the noble lord has just quoted, is, does he not consider that that in itself is an indication that the law is not working properly? Uh, no, I do not. I, as I say, only in a small minority of cases uh, has there been a successful prosecution. I should also add, however, that there have been a number of instances in which the case of which was taken forward involved prosecution for homicide, not assisted suicide. Noble Lord Wright, to remind us, my, my Lord, isn't the noble and learned Lord Wright? Thank you. My Lords, indeed, Jeff Whaley did die a dignified death in Switzerland last Thursday. But you know, most people can't afford to take their family to Switzerland for such a death. Or they can't get the medical report from their doctor 
to enable them to have such a death. Does the Minister agree that in a civilised society, someone in Jeff, in Jeff Whaley's position should be able to avoid months of being unable to swallow, unable to eat, to drink, to speak, to move, totally therefore cut off from communication? <coughs> Will the Minister discuss with his colleagues what can be done to change the law? Yeah. It is not the intention of the Government to seek to change the law in this area, and I emphasise that every case has to be considered according to its own particular facts and circumstances. I readily acknowledge that many of these cases are extremely tragic. My Lords, whatever the conflicting uh, views, and there are many, on public and prosecutorial policy in this area, I hope we can all agree that the current situation does present loved ones of people with motor neuron disease and similar conditions at the end of their lives with an emotional, ethical and legal minefield. Is the noble Lord the Minister confident that these people at a very, very difficult time are getting the advice and support that they need to navigate that? Well, I'm not in a position to say where such people seek advice on these matters, but such advice is available, and indeed the policy of the CPS with regard to this matter is publicly available. The Senior Deputy Speaker. 